What is up? What is good? How you living? How you feeling? How you doing? It is the L-E-F-K-O-E, man, Adam Lefko, and I need to get ready for the NFL draft because I'm going to be hosting it with this guy to my left, Connor Rogers. He's been focused on it for a year. I've been in NBA on TNT, NBA land, and I need to learn. So before I kind of give a breakdown of the show, Connor, with your beautiful brick wall and your perfectly quaffed hair, uh... Man, how deep in the draft are you right now? Just give everybody a taste. How many players do you got like written down and stuff? How deep are you? Deep, Lefko. I mean, over 300 players. I'm not going to say I know everything about all of them, but the doc is flourishing right now. I really started about two to three weeks after we finished last year's draft together when we were all kind of sitting around like this doing it from home. So... I'm excited, man. A draft highlighted by quarterbacks and skill talent and some blue chip players that we're going to talk about today. I can't wait to catch you up. So we're going to be uh, cramming for NFL draft weekend at the end of April. We're going to be doing this for eight weeks at one o'clock live three different places. The BR app, which I have on my phone right now, and I'm looking at all your ridiculous comments, uh, BR's YouTube channel. And, of course, Gridiron Twitter. So shout out to everybody on all of those platforms. Uh, if you are listening to this after the fact on the Left Go Show podcast, shout out to Rod Simba, the regulators, and Rodrigo for the intro music. A note to everybody. The only comments that we're putting on the screen and that I'm reading are on the BR app. That's just how it is. So they, ha- it's like Twitch. You got to be a subscriber. BR app is the comments that get read. Uh, Connor, this one just came in Big Philly 2020. That dude's hair is eight feet tall. Uh, Connor Rogers fan. Oh my God, the hair is back. They love it. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting intimidated. I'm getting a haircut on Saturday just because of this. Okay, Connor. Yeah. You're the one on TV, man, but but we love the people that are watching in the app, YouTube, Gridiron, no Twitter, wherever you are. The draft fans of BR are the best. They are loyal. And we're glad to be back a little earlier this year than usual. Uh, we are going to have great guests every week. This week, we are going to have four-time Pro Bowler, two-time All-Pro, first-round pick at LSU, holding down the left side of any offensive line you need. Andrew Whitworth will be joining us, get his perspective on some of the O-line players. I know he's been watching his Tigers, Jamar Chase, get a, a glimpse into that. And each week, we're going to do a different theme. This week, it's the question I ask to Connor every year. How many blue chippers are in this? How many guys that will be on a franchise and will feel like they're changing it? We're talking like J.J. Watts and Aaron Donalds and Randy Mosses. How many of those guys? And listen, those are the top of the top. Uh, If you have any questions, though, they can be about anything. It doesn't just have to be about this theme. Connor, my other big question for you, though, is this is a a year unlike any other. So let's zoom out to 30,000 feet. Last year, they got the combine done. They got a bunch of the pro days done. And then we had the COVID shutdown. So a lot of the information was already gathered. From front offices you've talked to around the league, how different is this year the fact that we don't even have a combine? And and what is being impacted the most? It's really difficult, Lefko. You got to realize with last year, there were some pro days already done. There was a combine already done where every team doctor, I remember getting back, getting off the plane, and it felt like within the week the shutdown began. So it was really just done in time where every team doctor got to do medicals. Teams got to sit in the same room and get to know these players. And even though everybody you know, was upset that, oh, some pro days are canceled and private workouts are canceled, this year, there is no in-person combine. They're not. Every meeting with players is on Zoom. Every team doctor is not getting to do their medical examination on all these players. There's going to be pretty much universally done across the league, of course, by certified people that work for the league. But it's really different. And it's they're doing their own crash course. We have free agency starting next week. And, and you have mm. new staffs meeting other new staffs. So... There's a lot going on here. How much can you trust all of these 40 times that are being posted it is a big one that everyone's talking about. We're seeing teams use GPS on field speed this year, more mm. so than ever, analytics more so than ever. So it's a different year left going. We're going to learn who has the best drafters and evaluators in the NFL real quickly. And in the app, I am Jay Richter makes a great point. 
uh, we just found out the salary cap is dropping by about 10 million. And he was saying, do you expect m more rookies to make the team to make up for this loss in revenue? It's, it's, so there's even more importance put on it. As I look at the top 10 teams picking in this draft, Connor, I hear this every year when there's a lack of communication. Oh, the great teams will have an advantage and the newer uh, units are gonna have a harder time in terms of scouts and front office. As you look at these 10 teams, who are the teams that have an advantage and who have a disadvantage with this crazy year with COVID? Well, I think when you look at an advantage, you start with the two that are on the back end, and that would be the Dallas Cowboys at 10 and the Denver Broncos at nine. With the Cowboys, they have someone there that runs their draft room and Will McClay that, if he wanted to, could have been a GM by now. But he likes living in the Dallas area, likes working for the Jones family and with the Jones family. And he's obviously a great talent evaluator. Look at that Cowboys team. Look at their drafts over the years. They hit on picks, not just in the first round. So the Cowboys are sitting pretty at 10. The Broncos at nine might surprise some people, but they made a big hire at GM in the offseason and a guy in George Payton from Minnesota. Sure, Minnesota never got over the hump, but they consistently had one of the better one to 53 man rosters in the NFL year after year from good drafting outside of the first three rounds. So I think when you look at it, those teams are poised to capitalize left go and even Sure, John Elway kind of gets out of the way by moving himself upward. He got better over the years with the drafts, as we've seen with the Broncos, but they still got to find their quarterback of the future. Now, you talk about the teams that I don't know if it's a disadvantage, but maybe a question mark. You look at your Eagles right there. There's been a lot of turmoil, a lot of turnover. Even yeah, let's take a look at the Douglas top 10 guy. again, just so I can see this. Yeah. So you said the Eagles at six, there's a lot of turnover. Who else? Well, you look at the Jacksonville Jaguars, it's pretty easy for them picking number one. You take Trevor Lawrence, but they got a hit on their picks after that. You have Urban Meyer and Trent Baalke working together. That's an interesting dynamic to me. Obviously, the Jets with Joe Douglas, a lot of people are, are feeling good after his first draft, but still question marks on the table. The Falcons, entirely new coaching staff, entirely new scouting mm. department. Uh, you look at the Lions, the same thing. New coach, new scouting department. The Panthers have Matt Rule there, but they made a new hire in Scott Fitterer, who a lot of people feel is ready for the job. So this top 10 is filled with a mix of experience and new and a lot of teams that need a roster makeover. Yeah, last year, the, the thing that felt new was we saw like Bill Belichick's dog and we, saw, we got like Zoom calls of GMs. But this year, we have no idea if there's any uniformity to these boards, because there's not a lot of crossover and everything seems to be hidden. Uh, I want to see your board, though, your top 10 big board. These are your favorite players in the draft. And then we are going to look at how many you actually see as blue chippers. So here's Connor's big board. Everybody in the app, everyone on Twitter, everybody on YouTube, take a look. For the top five there on the left, quarterbacks, the only one, Penny Sewell out of Oregon, the offensive lineman. On the right side, three wide receivers in the top 10. Heisman's uh, Trophy winner, Devontae Smith, there at nine. Micah Parsons, the lone defensive player in Connor Rogers' big board at number eight. And Kyle Pitts down there at number 10. Connor, how many of these guys do you see as blue chippers? And can you define what a blue chipper is in your mind? For me, it's the top eight. And I think all 10 of these guys are going to be pro bowlers, you know, all pro potential, because I know we're getting away from the pro bowl mattering anymore. But for me, it's the top eight here, left go. And how I'll break that down to you is, and the thing that probably hurts a guy like Kyle Pitts just a little bit, because he is special, is positional value. And are you going to be a franchise altering player, potentially all on your own in a sense. And that's why quarterbacks, you see them get that nice little bump there. Four of those eight are quarterbacks. They can change a franchise. When you look at Penne Sewell, he's somebody at your left tackle position. He could be a cornerstone for the next 15 years. Jamar Chase, the strength, Jalen Waddle, the speed, special, special attributes left go. Micah Parsons, the only defender on the list. If you look at these players, they could be the top of their position. That's what makes them a blue chip player, not top of the position or a good starter for their team. I'm talking about a special cornerstone in the NFL. When you see all those ridiculous lists come out, these guys can be some of the highlights of those lists. Garrett Greenlee commenting, where is Rashawn Slater? Don't worry, we are going to break him down shortly. He's right there on the cusp, but he's not in Connor's top 10. And I'm going to need you to explain Kyle Pitts in a second, but first we do have an app comment here, uh, and it is asking if we put all of the 10 guys into a Royal Rumble, 
which prospect would win. I'm going to just say this really quick. Our producer, when we were going over this uh, before the show, said that in Royal Rumbles, they always gang up on the big guy. So Connor, we're throwing Penny Sewell out. They all team up and they throw him over the top ropes. If you take him out, who do you see winning the Royal Rumble of the top 10? I'm probably going to roll with somebody like Micah Parsons, and it's going to be a bloodbath between him and Kyle Pitts, I think. It's a shame that they were all bullied Penny Sewell, and that never happened to him once in college. But when you look at Micah Parsons' left go at 6'3", you know, going to play around 250, and he runs a sub 4'5". So you're talking about the uh, the elite athlete, right? And what a if player, it's Penny Sewell versus Rashawn Slater? Penny Sewell versus Rashawn Slater in a first pin wins match. I'm going to go Penny Sewell. And I know a lot of people okay. think the low man will win in Rashawn Slater, but I think Penny Sewell has that reach to honestly get the upper hand in that one. The name that I am seeing in the comments the most, Stevie97 saying Kyle Pitts from, from day one will be the best tight end. Everybody loves Kyle Pitts. And in the NFL right now, where I'm seeing more double tight end sets than ever, you know, could this be a premium? You don't have him as a blue chipper. I kind of want to know, though, wh where do you see his ceiling? Who does he remind you of? He reminds me of Darren Waller all the way. You talk about a freakish catch radius, obviously the ability to run by any linebacker, to be bigger than any defensive back. Kyle Pitts is a special player. Now, the reason, and maybe we're just getting too carried away with the definition of blue chip is, he's not a complete player yet. I think the competition level, or at least the effort level as a blocker, is good and significantly improved in 2020 compared to 2019, but it's still not good. It's not a, a trait that you get excited about. What you're asking him to do is this, win down the field and make big catches, be an offensive weapon like a wide receiver. So is he on that level where you have guys like Rob Gronkowski and Travis Kelsey that are just perfect two-way players? He's not there yet. Can he get there? Mm. Absolutely. The size is there. The effort is there. And I do agree with that commenter from day one. And we don't ever say this about tight end. Look at all the guys over the years with those expectations. OJ Howard, TJ Hawkinson. They don't come in and produce right away. I think Pitts can be the outlier that is very productive as soon as he steps on an NFL field. So in my mind, the best landing spot would be for a team that already has a blocking tight end or one that kind of puts that tight end in motion and would utilize it well. Let's say he is a top 10 pick. Who are the teams that you'd be excited for his future if he landed on? Well, I think when you look at Atlanta or you start with Atlanta, there's no reason he okay. can't go to them at four, and that wouldn't surprise me. Now, I think Atlanta wants to solidify themselves on the defensive side of the ball, maybe collect more picks. But if you put him in the middle of the field with all that attention, those great wide receivers get on the outside of the field and you have an established veteran like Matt Ryan, I think the numbers would be phenomenal. And, and even if you put your best safety or best linebacker on him, I don't think it would matter. And the same could be said for the Dallas Cowboys. I know everybody wants them to really beef up their offensive line or, or get insurance there for the future or take the best cornerback. I understand that completely, but just having fun here, look at this guy after scoring that touchdown, him playing on the inside. You have Amari Cooper, C.D. Lamb, Michael Gallup, a good run game. I think Dak Prescott would be pretty happy he stayed there. And even one more left go. If you want to talk about target share where he can flourish and just get 10, 11 targets a game from day one, I think your Eagles would be willing to give him that. I was going to say, I didn't think about this earlier, but they already have Dallas Goddard, who's the really good blocker, and we know that they're going to want run some double tight end sets, so that is interesting to me. Uh, we do have another app comment, and I'm, I'm other than Thanos115, who says, I'm not going to trust a single word that Lefko says, which, love you, Thanos, you're the best. Uh, we have another one about Trevor Lawrence. Um, I, I saw one earlier that was, are you going to talk about Trevor Lawrence? I think he's pretty good. That was great. Another comment, though, is, is Trevor Lawrence a lock uh, for the first pick in the draft? Do you believe he is a lock, Connor Rogers? The, the lock of all locks, it's not even fun anymore. Even the, the sports books are over it. They're jacking up the odds Ooh. where it, it makes no sense. Uh, he is a lock for the number one overall pick, and he's almost so good uh, that we don't even really discuss him that much anymore. Mm, let's do that. Trevor I mean, Lawrence. Let, let's look at it. Yeah. Who's your PPC? So I'll tell you what, and a lot of people overreacted to this when I did the throwback one with John Elway, but the more realistic one of Josh Allen. 
he is what Josh Allen has developed into. And what I mean by that, coming out of Wyoming, Josh Allen was a little inaccurate. He had his question marks with decision making, but we knew he could throw it a mile. Big body, really good runner and can run through you. Look at Trevor Lawrence here. The accuracy, it, it might be my only question mark with him. It's not perfect. It's really good. But you look at him as a runner, RPOs, get him on the outside. He's hard to tackle. He loves running through contact. He can scramble and keep his eyes downfield to extend the play. He's a great leader. I mean, everything's there, Lefko, for him to be a franchise quarterback from the second he gets to the NFL. This is a very real talk question. Are you worried about the fact that Jacksonville might be too much for him, though? Listen, I, I think if he's level-headed enough and that he can overcome some of the problems quarterbacks have faced there. And even the question marks we have about Urban Meyer transitioning to the NFL, and there are plenty. I think Trevor Lawrence ran a college system, right? And I think Urban Meyer is a guy that understands how to adapt those college principles to the NFL game, which we've seen become more popular over the years, where the transition should be a little easier for him. I think they are going to try to develop him a run game. You've already seen them use the franchise tag on Cam Robinson, which is a questionable move, but at least they're trying to keep some offensive linemen intact rather than letting it all go and creating a bad situation for a rookie. So is it the perfect landing spot for a rookie quarterback? No, but for a blue chip player, he can overcome some of the problems they'll have early on in his career. Because at least I know with the Jets at number two, Makai Becton is going to be there for the next 10 years to provide some sort of pocket. You have Trevor Lawrence ahead of Zach Wilson. You have Zach Wilson as your number two. Uh, as a Jets fan, does this excite you? As someone that knows this organization well, is this the kind of guy that you would want to build a franchise around? Yeah, how can it not? You watch Zach Wilson play, and, and I'll tell you right now, he had the best ball placement out of anyone in 2020 and it's the incompletions honestly that impressed me he's not throwing to the amari rogers of the world or the chris alabes of the world so you look at zach wilson i just think how compact the mechanics are and how easily the ball gets out and how nimble he is in and out of the pocket and even willing mm. to make a move in the open field you see the athleticism you see the biggest guy in the world absolutely not i think he's a little bit bigger version of russell wilson that's what he reminds me of because of those compact mechanics because of the vertical passing game zach wilson is an exciting prospect left go he's not pat mahomes or the mormon mahomes or he's not aaron Rodgers. that's not who he is i think he's not that gunslinger necessarily but in terms of having a great arm everything seamlessly comes together in his mechanics and the mobility and honestly taking care of the football it's all there it all came together this year for him and byu by the way, I looked this up last night. Uh, Zach Wilson's middle name is Capono, which is Hawaiian for righteous. I learned that. I wanted to share it with all of you guys. Uh, Zach Wilson on the Jets at number two. Is that a great landing spot, a good landing spot? Does it make sense? Well, they're going to have some work to do in free agency to get more talent around him. There's no doubt about that. The Jet, we saw what happened with Sam Darnold. The offensive talent is lacking firepower, but in, in terms of the coaching fit and the new offensive coordinator and Mike LaFleur, when everybody was getting themselves excited about Zach Wilson rising into the first round many months ago, left go, everyone sat there and even he said it himself on an interview, the fit in a Kyle Shanahan offense is perfect. His ability to throw on the run, cut the field in half, uh, throw at all three levels with touch and accuracy, well, the Jets offensive coordinator, Mike LaFleur, was Kyle Shanahan's passing game coordinator for many years where they're going to run the same principles, that wide zone running game and all the things in the passing game that I just told you about. So if they can move, make a move, maybe sign a receiver, draft one, solidify that offensive line a little more so it's not just Mekhi Becton, it's a good fit mm -hmm. for him. Listen, when you're a quarterback drafted in the top three, are you ever going to this great landing spot? The answer is always no, but you can see the building blocks in place by Joe Douglas and the right offensive scheme for him that it's, you know, maybe not a match made in heaven, but a very, very good one for the number two overall pick. Only one that sticks out to me is when Peyton Manning hurt his neck and then Andrew Luck got to go to a Colts team that was a lot better than that first pick indicated they were. Uh, the other two quarterbacks that you have up there, Justin Fields and Trey Lance, 
I want to talk about Fields first because I was under the impression when I saw him uh, win against Clemson, I was like, oh, we're not going to debate this anymore. He's definitely one of the top guys. I feel like those debates are back. So what is a good, honest way to look at Justin Fields so that I'm not only thinking about the Clemson game and I'm not only reading people that are just hating on him all the time? Well, the people that don't like Fields will point you to the Northwestern game, and the people that do like Fields will point you to the Clemson game. And quite frankly, the type of player he is is probably somewhere in between that, and he is a great one. When you look at the big board as a whole, you saw Lawrence at one, but then it goes Wilson three, Fields four, Trey Lance five. Overall, that means these guys are special quarterback prospects. What I love about Fields is uh, the arm strength is really good. The deep throwing, especially when they had Alave on the field, was as good as anyone's. I mean, he can really push the ball down the field. Uh, there's no throw on the field that he thinks he can't make. And when you talk about as a real runner, not as a, hey, I need to scramble, I need to buy more time, and I'll take what's there. No, Justin Fields will run and lower his shoulder against a linebacker, or he'll try to make a defensive mm. back miss to pick up not seven yards, but ten. 15, 20, and it goes back to that conversation with Trevor Lawrence, a great leader. Since the day he transferred to Ohio State, came in, really owned that locker room or got the respect of the locker room, won a lot of big games. Everybody's knock on Justin Fields as he holds the ball long. A lot of college quarterbacks do. That's something that you have to coach out of these young guys, and all of them are very young. So I think whoever ends up with Justin Fields, as long as they can develop in the right way, if you say about any quarterback, He'll be a really good one. This is the part of the draft, if we were to assume that Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson go 1-2, where I feel like a lot of craziness can happen. Miami, we don't know what they're doing, whether it's Tua or looking for another quarterback. Atlanta with Matt Ryan, do they move on or do they play another season with him? Cincinnati, we just got a report today that Joe Burrow's coming back and he looks great. And with the Eagles, with Jalen Hurts, who knows if they really think he's the guy in the future do you see someone like Justin Fields going to one of those teams, or do you see another team maybe making a move to come up and try and getting someone of his caliber? I think there'll be a team that's just too aggressive to go get him. And the one that I like the best is the Denver Broncos, honestly, coming up from that mm. number nine spot. And, you know, they're picking at nine and then number 40. Maybe that's all it takes to jump up a couple spots. Maybe you go up to number four, and Atlanta's good enough with that because Atlanta sits there and goes, the guy we're going to take it for probably going to still be there at nine with all these quarterbacks coming off the board. So I look at Justin Fields and go, will he be for everyone? Probably not. And most quarterbacks aren't. Will he be for a lot of quarterback needy teams like the Panthers, like the Broncos? Yes. And the reason I look at the Broncos is, Lefko, what have you noticed on all of this footage? Where is he throwing the ball? It's 20 plus yeah, yards. Nice and deep. What do they have? Cortland Sutton, KJ Hamler, Jerry Judy's a guy that'll probably work in the intermediate underneath range, but all three of those guys can win big down the field. And when they don't, this is what he can do. He could take off and run and make a play and pick up extra yards. So I think we'll see somebody be aggressive to go up and get him. And I think the Broncos are the most seamless fit of them all. Uh, let's go to Carson Wentz's alma mater, North Dakota State, where, what do you know, another big, impressive physical quarterback with a nice arm and is not afraid to lower his shoulder, Trey Lance is there. He is also, since you have him in your top five, in this weird run of maybe they draft, maybe they trade, where would you like to see Trey Lance end up? Who could make a move? Well, I think, honestly, the best situation for him, and maybe it's a little too rich to go up and make that move, would be someone like the 49ers, where you have Jimmy G there. Maybe Trey Lance doesn't need to play right away, because let's not forget, he's coming out of a year of FCS ball, 2019 FCS ball, and then didn't have a season. He had one showcase game. So I think when you look at Trey Lance, ideally you like him to sit at least a couple games and get acclimated to the NFL level, but he's got it all. I mean, there's a reason I compared him to Air McNair, Steve McNair, that kind of throwback, the big body, the tough running, uh, the deep ball, and a lot of arm strength, right? Is the accuracy perfect right now? No, but can you see the ability to throw on the run? So I look at the Niners as one of those teams that we know they can develop him. We know they can maximize those traits. How much will it cost to go up and get him is the biggest question mark. And will people be patient with a quarterback that had one true year of FCS ball? They'll have to be. 
We're about to bring in Andrew Whitworth. Before we get there, though, it's been a very interesting season, off-season, with quarterback movement. Matt Stafford goes to the Rams, which we'll be talking to Whitworth about in about a second, the excitement there. I think a lot of it was spurned by Tom Brady and what happened with Tampa Bay. Are there any other teams that you're hearing about maybe paying more attention to the draft and possible quarterbacks, and maybe we had already thought their quarterback position was safe? Well, brace yourself, because I think the one right now, and it's a long shot, but it's still there, is the Seattle Seahawks. Now, the question is, we saw those list of teams that Russell Wilson would consider going to. Is that going to be high enough to get one of these quarterbacks? No, you'd have to find a way to go back up again. And let's not forget, the New York Jets have their first round pick this year and next year because of the Jamal Adams trade. But I think when you look at it with Seattle, there is clearly a stare down there from both sides. And we've heard it all from the Russ side. But I have heard from the team side that internally, they are trying to figure out who to send. And they will be sending people to these quarterback pro days because you can only send three. So I think what we're going to keep an eye on, Lefko, will Pete Carroll be going there? Will new offensive coordinator Shane Waldron be going there? Will John mm. Schneider be going there? That's what we need to keep an eye on. We know Seattle's done their homework on quarterbacks in the past, and we've heard these rush trade rumors forever. And because of the salary cap ramifications, it does seem like a long shot this year. But it is clear for both sides that I'm not so sure the long-term future with Russ and Seattle exists. And it is interesting to me internally that they have a scouting department that is essentially preparing like they have to treat they're going to be in position to take one of these guys. Now, it's great to do your due diligence. They're a good front office. It's understandable that they're doing that. But it still caught my eye a little bit when I heard that. Especially because Seattle does not have a first-round pick that is owned by your New York Jets that was acquired during the Jamal Adams trade. Let us bring in a man that has played 15 NFL seasons. He was a big-time pick for the Cincinnati Bengals and was there for about 11 years and now just wrapped up his fourth year with the L.A. Rams, the Bayou legend, Andrew Whitworth. Andrew, how are you, sir? Good to see you again. What's going on, man? I'm doing good. Uh, I, I need to ask, we went back and we saw some tweets that you wanted to go to the Senior Bowl before, that you're interested in scouting. I know now that you've seen a lot of new guys come into the room. Draft season for you, now that you've seen like 15 of them after you've been in the NFL, what are you actually looking for amongst all this madness and rumors? What actually catches your attention? I think you're really looking for guys that are more complete than, than flashy. I think that uh, you look now in this league, if you want a rookie to play early, uh, the flash plays look good, but the real consistency and the kids are going to last 16 games, going to be able to help a football team actually get to the playoffs or possibly make it, you know, make a run in the playoffs. They're going to be kids that play with consistency. And, and I think last year you look at some of those tackles and the guys that were coming out you had a lot of really special talented guys with flash to them and a guy like Tristan Wirfs it's like people were up and down a little bit on you know it's like I want this guy because of all his statistics of jumps and running and all this to just explode on the screen but really it was just he was just that strong and that good and then he gets in the NFL and it looks the same way it's like man this kid's playing football smoking cigarettes I mean it looks like it's just easy to him and that's that's the way he played the game and the way he showed as a rookie to be a heck of a football player. I love that. Andrew. Uh, one guy Andrew, that I know that you've been – what were you going to say? Go Connor? ahead, Lefko. I, I'm just curious. No, Andrew's an LSU guy. I got to know, is Jamar Chase the best wide receiver in this draft? I think he is. I just want to know what you think. I'll tell you this. I, I Usually for me, it's like I don't, I don't watch a ton of college sports all the time. Obviously, I'll catch my Tigers and, and uh, Alabama just for having played for Nick. I watch a lot of his football. But it's one of those things to me. I remember turning on the tape of him – and and just really like I turn on a game and I just catch flashes of like who's this receiver running the, you know this route up here in the top of the screen and then all of a sudden they start throwing the football and you see him the way he catches it so easy how big his hands are just at the catch point it's like you go man all right I don't know who this is I don't know if this is just a really good college football player but uh, this guy's got potential and then you start kind of really diving in to seeing some of the things he was able to do I mean I, I don't know who can be better because he looks like a guy to me that's like a really fast Anquan Bolden to I think of like when I think of like how smooth and just tough making hard catches but then also has speed and the ability to do something with the football Connor fast Anquan Bolden is great who was your who is the guy that you compared him to in your analysis 
I thought he looked like DeAndre Hopkins, but I, I'm with, you know, Andrew here that he's got juice, right? And you see it after the catch, too. He's running by guys that are starting in the NFL last year, and that's what jumps out to you right away for somebody that was 19 when he was doing that. So if you're a fast Anquan Bolden or an, a DeAndre Hopkins, I think you're going to be pretty good. And teams really quick before I go back to Andrew uh, Connor, where do you think, uh, Jamar, you'd like to see him land? Well, you brought up Alabama. He might be playing with Tua in Miami. I think that one makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, he might be reunited with Joe Burrow in Cincinnati. I think that's a perfect fit for him. You know, A.J. Green era might be coming to an end. They need a number one. Help out Joe Burrow when he's healthy and reunite him with Jamar Chase. All right, Whitworth, back to you. Penny Sewell, what have you seen out of this kid? He's the, the one offensive lineman that I'm seeing as a top five guy. What, has, what have your veteran eyes seen? Well, I think when you look at him, obviously the flash is there with him for sure. And, and, I, and I think that it's uh, that size, that ability to move and be that big. Uh, those are things that uh, you don't find very often. It's like when you get stopped by people and they're like, hey, what does my son need to be able to do to play in the NFL? Well, you know what? If you had all the traits Penny Sewell has, uh, there's the best answer I can give you. Uh, this guy's got the ability to move. He's big. He's strong. He's got long arms. I think he's uh, you know, a really young football player. I mean, he's only 20 years old, I believe. So, I mean, you look there, the development that's still to come. You look at like Rashawn Slater and how good he looks. I mean, he's three years older than him. So, you know, really there's a lot of upside still left for Sewell. And I think that's why you see him as a top five pick because it's as good and talented as he is right now. You know, he hasn't even grown up and really started to hit that man stride where it's gonna be like, all right, where's the grown man strength gonna come into this with all that athleticism? You know, what's the true upside of a young player like that? I think a Tyron Smith when he came out, you know, as far as looked like a great athlete, looked like he had long arms, could play. But then as he got stronger and older, man, what a special football player he became. The body really changes. Connor, I, Miami at three. I don't know if Atlanta, Cincinnati for sure at five. Where do you see as a good spot for Penny to go in this draft? Yeah, it goes back to Cincinnati. I know we love talking. I just did it with Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow, but we saw what happened when you don't protect, protect your quarterback last year. And this is someone that I'd, you know, I'd be curious to ask Andrew what a year off would be like playing offensive line, but I think he can come in and be lights out right away. The way he moves is like a tight end. He explodes out of his stance. Uh, the pulling is very, very special, really clean in pass protection. I'm excited to see where he ends up, and he's got to help one of these young quarterbacks, maybe even the Eagles there at six. I wouldn't even be surprised to see a surprise team trade up to get him because, sure, it's a good offensive line draft, and I was glad you brought up Rashawn Slater, but Penny Sewell is a special one. Yeah, Eagles are interesting. They don't really know what they have in Andre Dillard. They're going to let go of Jason Peters and Lane Johnson. He was a little bit banged up, so the depth with Jordan Maialata is a bit questionable. Uh, Whitworth, you brought up Slater. He had his pro day on Tuesday. Um, who does this kid remind you of? What comes right to mind? Because I've enjoyed your comparisons so far. You know, I don't know if I've pegged him on somebody yet. I mean, you know, watching a little tape on him, it reminded me a little bit of watching Tristan Wirfs last year, just in the sense of it's not like you see a lot of extravagant movement out of him, but he's just really solid and strong and athletic. And, you know, I I, 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 I don't want to jump out there ahead of myself. I think Penny Sewell is going to be a tremendous football player. I'm not entirely sure this kid's not really ready to play right this minute, though. I, I think Sewell's got some still polishing to do with all his athleticism and being really young and only having limited football experience at that age. But I think that this kid, man, he he really, he fits the strength, you know, all those metrics, speed, watching that pro day was impressive. Um, and then you watch his tape, man, he just seems to do it really simple. And it seems like, hey, I don't need a whole lot of movement. My head's not all over the place. My body's not all over my play, all over the place. Because when you get in the NFL, you're going to face a guy like Aaron Donald, a guy like Chandler Jones, a guy like Nick Bosa, Joey Bosa. These guys, they're going to learn to use all that balance and all that athleticism against you. And you better be steady and, and solid. And I think that's something you see this kid. His head doesn't move all over the place. His center of gravity is under control. Um, I think he's one of those guys that could literally plug and play and play well immediately. Connor, uh, we saw him playing right tackle there. I know he's played on both sides of the line because he has played for three years. Is this a guy that you think can sneak into the top 10? Oh, absolutely. I think I'd be more surprised if he wasn't a top 10 pick. When you look at him, uh, I thought it was even ridiculous. There were rumors about or questioning about arm length that he'd have to play guard. Sure, he'd be a great guard because you see the way he can cut off angles and how well he moves to the second level with reach blocks. But 
he was a really good right tackle for two years, then a really good left tackle for a year. And you could watch the tape against Chase Young and find that evidence. I think Slater comes in and like Andrew said, pro ready. I know he didn't play this year, but he's been working out like an absolute maniac. He'll be good to go. And you've got to love that versatility, even if people think it's all pro guard level, but you know he has experience at right and left tackle. Uh, that only enhances his stock going into this draft. So, Whitworth, I made a lot of money last draft because the one thing Connor – well, Connor's good at a lot of things, but he's really good at seeing where, like, the FanDuel DraftKings odds are wrong about the draft. Do you have one about offensive linemen, Connor, for this year's draft that you like? Put a little bit of money on. Well, Andrew kind of stole my shine a little bit. I put some money on Rashawn Slater being the first offensive lineman drafted, and I love Penny Sewell, and I think that, listen, he's the complete package, but – we're coming into a year where you're seeing all these cuts. You're seeing a Super Bowl team like the Chiefs are going to need two new starters at offensive tackle. There's going to be plenty of teams that need day one plug and play. I either need you on the left side or the right side. He checks every box, left go. There are teams that will probably look at Rashawn Slater and say, listen, I feel better about his polish right now. He's going to start for us day one, and he can play in any scheme. Hmm. Could, could you see, Connor, could you see a team like Cincinnati – saying, you know what, we have Jonah, but would we want to draft a kid like this who could possibly play left guard beside Jonah for a year and give us a chance to see whether we think that Jonah's going to make it at that position or this kid could eventually be our left tackle or right tackle going forward? That's exactly it, right? You look at it because you have the Jets at two, and even if they did hang on to Sam Darnold, we know Mekhi Becton is going to be the guy going forward. With, with the Bengals, I think it's a little bit more erratic right now. Jonah, he's a good player. There's no doubt about that. But if you take Slater, you know you can play him at left guard. Then you feel good about the left side of your offensive line, especially in the run game, especially with what they want to do on that side of the ball with Zach Taylor calling the plays and Joe Mixon, their workhorse back there. So I think Slater, when you look at his draft ceiling, it probably starts at five. And that might catch some people's attention, but I would not overlook that draft slot for him. Andrew, I got to talk to you about quarterback. Uh, Matt Stafford, who I'm sure that you faced many times over your career, is now your quarterback. Uh, this is not something where it's, hey, are, do you like him more than Jar Jared? Nothing like that. Uh, I'm curious, uh, what was your reaction uh, when you learned that Stafford was the guy? And I really want to know your level of respect for the guy, because I know that NFL players think about Matt Stafford a lot differently than fans think about Matt Stafford. Yeah, I think for, for all NFL guys that have been around and know really Matt's career and, and what he's been able to do, um, I think you look at a guy that you think of as just toughness and, and a chip on his shoulder a little bit to how he plays and competes. Um, you know, has not had the best run with teams there in Detroit and, and uh, talent around him, I would say. But a guy that uh, there's nobody in this league that doesn't have a lot of respect for that dude, the way he competes, some of the throws he makes, and, and really the style of play he plays with at that quarterback position. Connor, you got any questions for Witt before we let him go? Because he's already killed it, and I think he's ready to be uh, the next draft analyst somewhere. I just want Witt to join us next year. After he and all this, I want him to come back, and we'll go through all the offensive linemen. We'll do this again. I know he's going to play until the end of time. He's going to outlast Brady at this point, but I still want him to join us for the draft. Let's do it next year. I'm in. Awesome. Andrew Whitworth, thank you so much. Everybody that's watching right now, Twitter, YouTube, the BR app, shoot that man a follow. Andrew, man, thank you for your time, dude. I appreciate y'all, man. Have a great one. Thanks, awesome. Andrew. All right. Uh, we talked a little bit about wide receivers. He was really good. Uh, and I, want, I hope he hears that because that was really good. Um, it was awesome. We have a, an app. What were you going to say, Connor? It was just awesome. It's, I always like Lefko. You know, an exercise I've done – with offensive line prospects recently, like the last two years, because, you know, you actually start making some connections is go over the draft class with guys that have at least played offensive line, at least at the college or NFL level or are coaching it at the NFL level. You'll hear a perspective that will blow your mind. There's just different nuances at that position. And I thought it was interesting. He had a really, he hinted at it right away that Slater might be a little bit more pro ready than Sewell, even though Sewell has some special traits that catch our attention all the time. 
Yeah, and I think what, what he said about Tristan Wirfs was a great point. What I would also say that in the same draft, we saw Makai Becton, who was a little bit more of a quote-unquote project that was a physical specimen that was equally as impressive. So we got a taste of both last year. I think last year's offensive line crop will end up going as one of the best we've seen in quite a long time. Uh, let's go. I got one app comment here. It is who should be the first wide receiver drafted. This is from P. Hall 27. Uh, who, do you, who did you have as your first? Was it Jamar Chase, right? It is Jamar Chase. I think when you look at what he did as a 19-year-old at the highest level of college football, and like I said, you can turn on the film and see him running by guys or mossing guys that are starting in the NFL right now. Special stuff, special player, should be wide receiver one. Okay, but I know that you have a man crush on number two, and we're going to get to Devontae Smith and how he's not up there. You have Rashad Bateman at number four, Terrace Mitchell, uh, Marshall, excuse me, at number five. How would you compare Jamar Chase and Jalen Waddell? Completely different, and I think in great ways, where if Jalen Waddell didn't have a serious injury this year, he would have made it an interesting conversation if he was going to be the first guy off the board because he could fly, left go. We're talking about speed in the four twos or on field speed. That was special stuff in pads, catch and run phenomenal. And I know when I posted the comparison and BR Gridiron posted the comparison to Tyree kill, a lot of the reaction was, and I understand this. They're like, we get a Tyree kill each year, but nobody's Tyree kill. This is the closest it's going to be. This is somebody that is going to run in the four twos on the field in pads with acceleration after the catch that He's faster than everyone else. And you see two guys running behind him. They can't stay with him underneath the field. Get up and go. I think when you, and he was a phenomenal kick returner, screens, he's always open. Jamar Chase is somebody that he's a little bit of, hey, he's covered, but we know he's open. We're going to throw it up to him. With Waddle, there's times where if you punch in just a little bit, you can't find any other defender on the field. They're falling down. They're grabbing their ankles. So, I look at it, if you need a deep threat, if you need more speed in your offense, you're considering taking Waddle first. If you need somebody that is just going to be stronger than everyone else they face, and even after the catch as well, you're going to go with Chase. Uh, my super hot take here, I don't think you can go wrong with either. I think both will be two of the best receivers in football two years from now. We have seen teams like... Uh, the Chiefs take McCall Hardman, and we go, oh, it's a great fit. We have seen teams like the Raiders take Henry Ruggs and go, oh, they don't even know how to use this guy. So where would you like to see someone of Waddle's profile go to maximize that speed? Oh, it's a tough one, right? Because you want to go somewhere that they're going to throw the ball down the field. So let's pull up our draft order here. I, I think when you look at it, you know, the Chargers at 13 – would excite me. We saw what Justin Herbert did last year, and I will gladly mm. take the L on Justin Herbert. He blew expectations out of the water. And sure, they're a team that has drafted plenty of wide receivers over the years, but you're looking at a really good vertical passer, obviously somebody that can win down the field. You put him across from Keenan Allen, my goodness, left go. It would be electric. The problem is, I don't think he makes it there. If you're the New York Giants at 11, you cannot pass on Jalen Waddle unless Kyle Pitts is somehow there and you value that more for Daniel Jones. So he's a special player. And he, you know, like you said, you want to see him go somewhere that they're going to throw the ball down the field. Fortunately, in his draft range, I think he's going to be okay. Hmm. Uh, let us talk about the Heisman Trophy winner, Devontae Smith, who I am already predicting this is going to be the heated debate for the next two months. It will be the discussion for years to go because it's the age old productivity versus measurables. And so why would you say in your mind that you have Devonte Smith behind them? You still have him as a top 10 prospect, but behind those other two. Right. He's great. He's well-rounded. He catches everything. His tracking is better than the other two, but he's not stronger than Jamar Chase and he's not faster than Jalen Waddle. And I'm not just talking about putting these guys on a track and saying, hey, you know, go run the 40. I'm, I mean, you say right there, Lefko, DB, DBs can stay in stride with Devontae Smith, but his tracking of the ball and high pointing of the ball is so good that it often doesn't matter. So He's a really good athlete, for, and sure, he's going to weigh around 175. We don't see a lot of guys play 
at that weight. I know he's gotten Marvin Harrison comparisons. I see him more as a That's Santana who I was Moss gonna kind say. of player. Yeah, he's more Santana Moss to me, who was very, very good. Let's not forget. But quite frankly, he he's not he's a good athlete, not an elite athlete on an NFL field. He's a strong player for his size. He's not elite strength, but he's so crafty. At, he has a great demeanor that he'll find ways to win no matter what. I don't think he lasts this long, but 21 to the Colts would be pretty special, just with all the Marvin Harrison comparisons there are. I mean, we didn't think CeeDee Lamb would make it out of the top 15 last year, so never say never. And if the Colts have to go up a couple spots, I'd like that one. Uh, do you have any draft prop bets for this? We already have one for offensive linemen. What about wide receivers? Last year, you nailed it and said Henry Ruggs could go first. What about this year? Yeah, you know, this is a little bit of a wild card, a little bit of a long shot. And I've seen the odds at plus 700 and even way higher than that. Why not throw some money on Jalen Waddle being the top wide receiver being taken? How, are we ever surprised anymore, Lefko, when one of the fastest guys ends up being the first? This goes back to Darius Hayward Bay. It doesn't. Nothing ever yep. surprises you anymore when speed is taken. It just doesn't anymore. And you have all these old school NFL scouts that are, you know, looking at players that didn't play this year and making up ridiculous quotes along the lines of that. Does that happen to Jamar Chase? It shouldn't. I don't think it will. But when those odds are that ridiculous, that's one that's fun to me. Uh, one that people are sleeping on, and it might be off the books at some point because I think it's so ridiculous. I saw Mac Jones over under pick 17 and a half. Uh, smash the under on that. Mac Jones should be a top 15 pick. And that just smelled like free draft money to me. I was so excited, Lefko, that I texted you literally as soon as I placed my bet. You did. And I hit up my guy and he said, they're not available at my book yet. And I went, ah, crap. So I'm hoping that it's still there uh, when they eventually pop up. We're about to do some rapid fire Q&A in the BR app. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm rating there. So get in there and comment there. We do have one from our own buddy, Matt Denstit, fill in the black. Micah is the best linebacker prospect since. And then he added Keekly there, I guess, his own answer. Uh, Connor, you know, is, is Micah Parsons that wild? And who does he remind you of? Or best prospect since? Oh, best prox prospect since at linebacker since Roquan Smith that went to the Bears, who really turned it on this year. He had a quietly a yes. phenomenal season. And my player comp, if you looked at BR Gridiron, was Luke Keekly. So you look at it, it, it just, it's a layup. It's such a, you know, I don't always feel great about comparisons for saying this is who he'll be, but this kind of athleticism and range and reading your keys and getting downfield to make a tackle. He's a four or five runner. He's got great size. Uh, he's a good blitzer. The coverage instincts, are they perfect yet or up to Luke Keekley standards? No, but he's such a young player that those will develop with his athleticism. He can run with any linebacker and tight end. So uh, I would pay a lot of money to just watch him and Kyle Pitts do one-on-ones for an entire afternoon. Uh, drafting a defensive player in the top 10 where your other nine guys are all offense is tough. Uh, I'm, I'm just kind of looking around. Who do you think could pull the trigger? It is interesting. You have Carolina there at eight, and we got these Luke Keekley comparisons. Uh, what is there a team that kind of caught your attention for this Penn State linebacker? Uh, yeah, I think you go with Detroit at seven. You know, they traded for Jared Goff. We're going to see how that goes. Uh, maybe they mm -hmm. trade back if a team comes up for one of those quarterbacks that fall. I don't think Detroit is in this big hurry to take a quarterback and, and develop him or get him on the field. I think they'll ride it out with Jared Goff right now. And they need to get better on the defensive side of the ball. And they need to get more athletic on both sides of the ball. And this solves those things right away and if you watch any of those Campbell press conferences left go I think it's pretty obvious the kinds of players he likes these smash mouth kind of guys that come out of the Big Ten I think Micah Parsons is a really really good fit there in Detroit if not there he might slide out of the top 10 a little bit you know do the Giants do enough in free agency that they go hey we got our skill guys in free agency we could take a linebacker at 11 we know Dave Gettleman has no problem doing that Onya uh, said, oh, so he's like Jared Davis. That was my other thing, too, is the, Detroit has had some issues drafting. Ernie Sims uh, was a linebacker they took early on in that draft, too. 
Uh, the Panthers, I just I think about that defense with Jeremy Chin, and they they went last year and drafted all of their players on defense. The the, the offense has experienced their defense is all defense, but I or is all young guys, but they they need a lot of help everywhere. Worst kept secret though, Lefko with the Panthers, they are dying for a quarterback, and if they can't get Deshaun Watson, I think they'll they'll use the same leverage, use whatever capital they have to be aggressive. Maybe they sit at eight. But maybe there's a guy they like so much that they move up to six with your Eagles, four to the Falcons. I think the Panthers are going to be all over getting a franchise guy. Yeah, I think also as as we look around what team needs are, let's wait until after next week. Uh, we are about to see the franchise tags go official. That's kind of been settled. And then free agency will open next week. And, and that's this is the difference between this and the NBA is that we are going to have the free agency and then the draft, and we'll see how that develops. Let's go to now some rapid-fire Q&A as we wrap up the NFL draft crash course here. Uh, Black Finn asking, Travis Etienne of Clemson or Najee Harris out of Alabama, who I covered in high school, which is crazy. Connor, who's your RB pick there? It's going to be Najee Harris, and it was not easy, Lefko. These guys, to me, both graded out as top 30 players, and it's going to come down to what do you want for your offense. ETN is a home run hitter with great speed. I saw it as pro day. He got up to 215 pounds and still ran a 4-4. But let's talk about Najee Harris, who at six foot two, 230 pounds, is still running away from defenders in the SEC and there you go, the circle button, B button, whatever you want to use, the full package of moves at the second level of the field. The spin move, the stiff arm, the cut, the hurdle, he's got it all. He reminds me of Steven Jackson left. Go look at that little shoulder at the end that says, I don't care that we're going out of bounds. You're going to feel this contact. Najee Harris is a special player. He's built for 30 touches from day one. He can pass protect. He can catch the ball like a receiver. That's why you see a lot of those Matt Forte comparisons as well. It's these are really good running backs at the top of this draft. You can hear how excited I get when we talk about the skill guys. So Najee, I know we're doing rapid fire. Oh, okay. We'll go on. Give me one team for Najee. Just give me one. Oh, uh, Najee Harris. Let's go with. Oof. Uh, the Steelers, I guess. Okay. I was also looking at Arizona at 16. It might be a little bit too early. Okay. This one from Trap Trap Z Dizzle. Which top prospect has the most red flags that teams should avoid look deeper into? And this is big for a draft year in which we don't have a lot of information. So I'll give you one that I don't want to raise like the character concerns or anything like that, but I'll tell you that teams are doing an immense amount of homework on right now because he is so talented is Jalen Phillips, the pass rusher from Miami. Uh, there was a time in the recruiting process when he was going to UCLA, this guy was the next Miles Garrett. And at, it got so bad with injuries that he had to medically retire from football at one point. He doesn't play wow. the year he transfers to Miami. Then he gets on the field in 2020 under Manny Diaz and he lights the world on fire. Great run defender, can bend at six foot five, 260. I mean, special stuff in this edge group. Teams are trying to figure out, one, is he okay medically to continue on or can we rely on him? And two, you know, how much does football mean to him? I know it sounds stupid, but these are questions that scouts get paid to look into. So I would say he's sure. the most important one because if those things check out, he's a top 20 pick. And as you were telling me before, it is not a big, deep class of pass rushers. Uh, and also what's very interesting is it's a great crop of pass rushers in free agency. So we'll see what happens there. Next one, J underscore my. Should the Jets keep Darnold or draft Zach Wilson? This is right down your alley, Connor. Um, well, I think they should draft Zach Wilson and trade Sam Darnold. And I think they will draft Zach Wilson and trade Sam Darnold. So I think you're looking at it. Uh, all the buzz is that Sam Darnold is going to bring back at least a second round pick. Maybe you get some some change with that, a two and a four, a two and a conditional three, something along the lines of that. And, and every bit of rumblings I have heard is that the Jets are really zeroing in on Zach Wilson at two if they find the right trade package with Sam Darnold. Niners, who are you thinking? <sighs> uh, Niners, Bears. Washington football team. Those are the three. Mm. 
They got Heineke. Why would they do that? Okay, uh, we're gonna get one more rapid fire Q and A. Shout out to everybody on the BR app, the YouTube page, and of course BR Gridiron Twitter. Herschel underscore Welkner. Who's gonna bring the funk, the thump, the old school nitty gritty? My guess is that kid from App State. What do y'all think, Connor? Funk, thump, nitty gritty. Oh, the nitty gritty is the part that got that has me kind of tied up here. We'll keep it with the blue chippers here, and I'll still say Micah Parsons. I'm telling you right okay. now, y- you just don't see a lot of linebackers Connor, built like that. Who's the App State guy that he's talking about? Sorry for interrupting you. School me on whoever he's saying. Uh, let's take a look in the doc because I don't even know who he's thinking of with oh, the, the thump. He's trying the to thump. mess us up. I I think he is, and actually, I really like that. Well, first one in App State. I, have, I still have Jalen Virgil in the dock, the wide receiver. I don't know. It's, we'll figure it out at some point, Lefko. We're probably looking at day three players at that point. Okay. So, Michael Parsons. I love when the rapid, yeah, fire, we, the rapid fire throws me off. I appreciate that from our, uh, from our pal Herschel Walker like that, there. Too. I like that, too. Um, okay. Shout out to everybody in the app uh, that's been commenting. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, do you have... Do you have an ultimate man crush in this draft? Uh, is it Jalen Waddle or is it somebody else? I'm going to go with Jalen Waddle, I think. But the name you're going to hear me throw around as the, the day three nonstop day crush would be Jalen Darden, another speed wide receiver out of North Texas. So we'll keep it with the wide receivers in this one. I cannot wait until we do our version of who he play for, where you name prospects that are not real and I just fall for them hook, line, and sinker. Darden, I I got you. Uh, We are going to be doing this, guys, every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, right here in the BR app, Gridiron, Twitter, and the BR YouTube. We did blue chip prospects this week. Next week is going to be most electric players. This is going to be the fast guys, the speed guys, the guys that can jump over people, the guys that kind of like LaVisca Chenault last year, we get excited about going up to the season because what happens if he is everything he's cracked out to be? Uh, And as you see there on the bottom of the screen, send videos in the NFL draft community in the BR app. That's your chance to win swag from hoodies to everything else that we have. And we might be playing your comment. So make sure you do that. Uh, and for all the guys listening on the Left Go Show podcast, we love it. Connor, any final note before we get out of here? Uh, it was a blast. We've been so excited to kick this off. Uh, our guy, Andrew Whitworth, was phenomenal. And we're going to have guests all the time. So if you really enjoyed that portion of it, that's great. If you want to listen to the show, you can listen to it on the Left Go Show stream. If you want to rewatch the show, you can go to the Bleacher Report app or YouTube. Or, you know, I think a lot of people like to rewatch on YouTube. So there it is. We're going to be doing this every week until the draft, Left Go. Awesome. Uh, you're right. Whitworth killed it for Connor Rogers, for Whitworth, for all of the people at Bleacher Report and Turner that have me broadcasting out of a briefcase and have somehow figured out a way to do this. God bless you. Uh, Brett, Canvas, or everybody that helped put this thing on, we're excited to do it. So to everybody out there in the VR community, have an awesome day and enjoy as we get ready for the NFL draft. See you guys.